the X is the Xbox gonna be better or is the PlayStation gonna be better? I mean, the Xbox has got more cores, but they're slower, but the PlayStation, it's got fewer cores, but it's fast. How's it gonna be faster? Wait, I think I've got it. That's smart shift. Hey guys, Turk here, hope you're having a great day. I posted to Twitter what kind of content y'all wanted to see, and sure enough, you guys responded you wanted more PlayStation 5 explanation videos. So I went ahead and dug through the Mark Cerny tech description once again, and you know, we've already covered the PlayStation 5 hardware. We actually built a simulated PlayStation 5 to see what kind of what kind of frame rates we could see going into the future. And we also talked about the RDNA 2 performance per watt spec and what that kind of means when it goes to the PlayStation 5's performance. So I think there's only one last piece of tech to cover in that description, and that's going to be AMD Smart Shift technology. So rather than getting too deep and dirty into it right now, let's actually go back to the bathroom. I think we got a pretty good explanation cooking up. So if y'all happen to watch Mark Cerny's technical description of the PlayStation 5, you'd no doubt heard about the technology called Smart Shift. I want to give you guys an oversimplified illustration of what that technology actually does. And if we look over here to our little plumbing set, this is going to be what we use. So up at the top, we've got our power limit, which is defined by the PlayStation hardware. And then on the left, we're going to have our CPU represented by the purple pinwheel here. And then on the right is going to be our orange graphics card with the helical wheel. Now, the helical wheel is harder to push, so it will require more water or power. And when we got everything in balance, everything's in line, we'll notice that both of these little wheels, they happen to spin pretty freely. And as we supply proper power to the system, all the wheels are spinning, everyone's hunky-dory, perfect. But what happens when you're going to want to run a more graphically intensive game? Well, Smart Shift is going to shift things more to the graphics card. So if we let gravity do that for us, we'll push the CPU up a little bit so we get more flow to the graphics card. We apply more power to the system, and you'll see that the helical spin wheel starts to spin a little faster, and the purple spin wheel, the CPU, it's actually not spinning as fast or as hard. So this is a pretty good representation of a graphical dependent workload. Again, guys, that's a way oversimplification of what AMD Smart Shift can do, but you know, it does highlight a couple key things that we need to dig into more. And you know, I've actually been collecting a lot of data on real desktop hardware to kind of show you guys what it means when it comes to power limiting. So today we're gonna be using the Ryzen 7 3700X. We're gonna let it go all full speed and we're only gonna be changing a couple different knobs. We'll talk about that in a second. And then for the GPU, we're gonna use the RX 5600 XT. Again, we're not gonna be clocking it down and undervolting it. We're gonna let it go and do its thing, but we are gonna be limiting only one variable for both of these pieces of hardware, and that is their power limits. In order to do that on the CPU, we're gonna actually use a feature called Precision Boost Overdrive. If you're not familiar with that feature, it's actually a good overclocking feature that's used with the 2000 series and 3000 series AMD processors where you can actually override the power limits and make the processor use more power in order to get more performance using firmware-based solutions. We're gonna be a little innovative here and we're gonna actually use a lower power limit in order to force the processor and the firmware to use different power limits and different frequencies in order to meet that uh, PPT value. Now for the GPU, we don't have as fine grain control over the boost clocks and the voltages dynamically as the system's going, but we do have a feature baked into the Radeon driver and that is just the raw power limit. We're able to uh, define the power to be minus 50% all the way up to plus 10%. So we're, we've got a good range of power that we can run the graphics card at. But before we dig into the data, let's talk about the games we're gonna be doing. Now, since we're gonna be using a lot of different variables and a lot of different situations, we're only gonna be using two different games today. The first one's gonna be Ashes of the Singularity Escalation, but we're also gonna be playing Shadow of the Tomb Raider as well, very GPU limited, and we're, all, we're gonna be seeing the inverse of that and seeing how the CPU power can be going towards the GPU to get additional performance. So let's dig into the data. The first resolution we're going to be looking at today is 1080p, and that's a good indicator to see if we've got any CPU limitations or CPU bottlenecking 
And on the left chart here, we've got our GPU power limiting experiment. And on the right, we've got our CPU power limiting experiment. So let's talk about the GPU first. As we go from minus 50% on the power limit all the way up to positive 10, ashes of the singularity there in blue really doesn't care how much power you're giving the graphics card. We're gonna be stuck at right around 58, 59 frames per second, clearly showing CPU dependence there. And what's interesting for Shadow of the Tomb Raider, once we go above minus 40% on the power limit, the FPS coming out of the game is actually starting to get really leveled off. Now let's take a look at the CPU limited chart on the right. What we find interesting here is that there is a really sharp cliff when it comes to increasing the power limit all the way from 20 watts all the way up to 30 watts, where right at around 25 watts we just see the biggest uh, frames per second improvement in both games, and after we get to about 30 watts, things start to level off. So if we're specking these processors at right around 40 watts, we do have a little bit of wiggle room, but we'll talk about that more a little bit later in the video. Uh, bumping up the resolution to 1440p starts to push the dependence onto the GPU, and for this 5600 XT, we really are starting to see it getting pushed to its limit. So let's take a look at the GPU power limiting experiment, and again, Ashes of the Singularity in blue there really doesn't care how much power you're allocating to the graphics card, so there is some room to save from a power budget perspective. But for Shadow of the Tomb Raider here, we do see a pretty linear as well as pretty steep frames per second per watt trend there, which doesn't bode well going into the 4K charts. I don't want to spoil anything, but we do see as we increase the power allocated to the GPU, we are seeing a pretty good FPS performance improvements. Uh, going to the CPU based one, we start to see a more sharp performance improvement as we increase the CPU wattage. And at 25 watts, we've practically have leveled off with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Ashes of the Singularity, it still does require right around 30 watts or so to get ideal performance. Again, still pushing right at 60 frames per second. 4K is gonna be the true standard when it comes to PlayStation 5 performance. And we're really starting to see the CPU be <laughs> lifting up its hands and say, all right, GPU, it's all you. Uh, right at around 25 watts, we see both of these games saying, you know, we don't need additional wattage to our CPU. And sure enough, chart on the left, as we're increasing the power limit to the GPU, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is starting to see better and better FPS performance, which is honestly a necessity at this frame rate. And then Ashes of the Singularity actually starts to see a power limit of minus 30% starting to be where it needs additional juice. Uh, again, these experiments kind of just show, you know, what it means when we change the power limit and how that impact impacts frames per second. So when we're looking at the GPU clock speeds and utilizations, we're only going to be using 4K with Shadow of the Tomb Raider to hopefully reduce the amount of data that's coming across you guys. Uh, and this first chart with the clock speeds, uh, again, we see the G CPU is running at its pretty good speed, right around 3.7, 3.6 gigahertz, which is pretty good at 30 watts. Uh, but what we do notice is at minus 40% on the power limit on the GPU, we're running right at 1200 megahertz. But if you give the GPU enough juice, if you go up to plus 10% on the power limit, you're able to get an additional 500 megahertz, which is incredible. It gets us to the advertised actual boost clock for this graphics card which is actually really great. But let's take a look at the utilization numbers and the wattage numbers and see what happens. Uh, the blue bar here is the CPU utilization and we only see about a 4% increase as we increase the power limits. And then looking at the gray bar, that's the GPU utilization. We are clearly pegging the graphics card as much as it can. And as we increase that wattage, we are seeing pretty decent frames per second improvements. That's the orange bar. But what's alarming here is the yellow bar. At minus 40% on the GPU, we are burning right around 80 watts on the ASIC power. And going all the way up to plus 10% on the GPU, we're starting to burn 139, 138 watts, which is a pretty drastic shift. That's about a 50 watt, yeah, fi almost 50 to 60 watt range. And there's no way we're gonna be able to pull that kind of wattage from the CPU power budget. So. Hopefully RDNA 2 helps out in this instance, but let's take a look and see what the CPU's got going for it. 
For the CPU power limit versus utilization, we're only going to be looking at 1080p with Shadow the Tomb Raider in order to get that worst case delta that we saw earlier in the video. And at 22 watts, we are clearly starving both the graphics card and the processor, and we clearly need more wattage for both components in this case. And as we increase the wattage of the processor all the way up to 30 watts, we can see that it eventually boosts all the way up to the PlayStation 5 advertised frequency, and the graphics card almost gets to its rated frequency as well, right at 1600 megahertz. So, you know, clearly we're seeing good shifting here. And let's take a look at what the power and the clock utilizations look like for these. Now for the CPU power limits versus utilization, I thought it was very important to include the GPU in this as well, since we saw the relationship where if we increased the CPU power limit, we also saw an increase in the GPU frequency. So let's uh, step our way through these charts as slow as we can. Now that bottom blue bar is gonna be our average frame rate and we see a huge jump going from a 22 watts on the CPU up to 25 watts. But we don't see as large of a jump going from 25 watts all the way to 30 watts with the CPU. And as we increase the frame rate, we are starting to see the GPU utilization increase as well, which is pretty good. And we are also seeing a you know, similar trend when it comes to the average ASIC power coming from the GPU. Now, what's interesting here is at 22 watts, our CPU is actually working really, really hard at 63% utilization. And as we increase the wattage, we increase the boost clocks, and we are being able to utilize less of the CPU in order to do just the equal amount of work required to enable the GPU. And what I find really interesting here is the power deltas between the lowest spec and the 30 watts is only 8 watts. And that's not a lot of power to be donating to the graphics card for additional performance. Man, guys, that was a lot of data. Uh, let's take a minute to digest it a bit and, you know, let's summarize what we've just saw. So with the GPU power limiting experiments, as we increase the power limit to the graphics card, we do see in graphically intensive games, the frames per second does improve quite a bit. And that's a great thing. If there's extra juice that's available in the system, our graphics card would love to eat it and it'll give us good frame rates. But with CPU dependent games, as we change the power limit on the graphics card, we just don't see that much of an improvement. But when it comes to the CPU limited power tests, you know, once we got up to that 30 wattage point, there really was no extra benefit for giving more wattage to the CPU. So unless the PlayStation 5 is allocating, you know, 50 watts to the CPU, there's just not a lot of wiggle room when it comes to giving more wattage to the graphics card. You know, I think when we were running Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 4K, between the minus 40% power budget and the minus 20% power budget, you know, that was about a 25 watt gap there. So you know, there's not that much extra wattage the CPU can offload. So maybe RDNA 2 helps out in that instance. Maybe being in the PlayStation 5 itself and not in the desktop computer, we get better performance. You know, there's a lot to be seen, but clearly our data does show that as each of these components is able to offload power, the other component is more than willing to take that power and improve performance across the board. Guys, I've loved putting this video together. I love dealing with lower level uh, firmware and hardware stuff. If y'all have got additional questions, hit me up down below in the comments. I post all of this stuff to my Discord. We talk about the experiments and all that. So if you want to get involved in the process, you know, come over to my Discord. I do all this again on Twitch. I uh, do it live. So make sure you follow me over there, twitch.tv slash the Turk. And of course, smash that subscribe button here on YouTube. You know, we've got more hardware reviews. We've got a MacBook review coming. We've got more graphics cards. We got all sorts of stuff. So make sure you're following me. Hit that alert bell down there as well. That way you can know when I post new videos. But again, thank you guys very much for tell asking me to do this video. I've loved doing it. I hope to catch you in the next one.